So when buying a property, where were you hoping to keep your holding costs? By holding costs, I mean uh, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, mortgage insurance, flood insurance, and HOA. In this particular example, you're paying cash. Therefore, you'll only be responsible for taxes, insurance, flood insurance, and HOA if there is one. Where would you like to keep those holding costs? Maximum a thousand. A thousand dollars a month. Yes. Perfect. So let's let's review what it is that you're looking to do. You're looking to leverage fifty thousand dollars cash, and have a holding cost of twelve thousand dollars a year. Yes. Okay. Other than South Florida, are there any other areas that are that is of interest? Um. Yeah, well, I would like to keep be closer to like the Doral area because my wife works there. I am retired. Cool, cool. And so in the event that $50,000 and $1,000 a month isn't feasible, what are your options? So as you're writing down this question, what I want everyone to hear is that you always come from curiosity. Mm -hmm. Always be curious and be prepared to challenge their thinking because they might think 50,000 can get them something. And then the reality is, is there's a thousand different angles we can possibly go. So I'll give you an example. I remember there was a lead that came in. It was $55,000. They actually inquired on a mobile home. They actually inquired on the mobile home. And this person said, I was like, hey, so how can I help you? And they said, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at investing. Cool. What's, what's your goal? And she said, I was interested in buying seven to eight properties. Wow, seven properties. How exciting. What, what would that do for you? Well, that's my retirement strategy. I want to rent proper, I want to own property and then live off of the residual. You know what? That's actually my retirement strategy too. I mean, if I own 10 properties that are giving me a thousand dollars return, that's ten thousand dollars a month that I can live off of as retirement. And if I want to travel the world, I could sell one property and live off the funds. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Instant report. I can connect now. She has a goal that matches my goal. Now, if that's the first time you heard of this beautiful idea of retirement, use it. That's the reason I came into real estate, Lee. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. And so I instantly connected with this lead. And I said, okay, so you're looking at buying seven to eight properties over time. How much cash do you have to put towards your first purchase? They said 20%, which by the way, wasn't the answer to my question. 20% of what? <laughs> well, exactly. I didn't answer it that way. That's the yeah. way I answered it to you guys. And yet I then asked the back part of that question. You see the back part of that question is, okay, so when you put the 20%, where were you hoping to keep your payments? May I explain what that means? She said, yes. And I said, principal interest, taxes, insurance, mortgage insurance, flood insurance, and HOA. If you were to put all of that together, where were you hoping to keep your payments? And she said, um, well, between 1500 and 3000 a month. And I said, interesting. 
that's a huge range. And she said, well, I don't have any debt. And I said, ah, oh, kudos to you. I mean, that's awesome. Now, I guess my question to you, I guess my question to you is, hey, look, I get that's a huge range. And the reality is, is we're looking at investment properties. So if you had your tenant back out of the deal or, or walk away and you had to carry that nut for three months, the difference between 1500 and 3000 is like six grand. Well, I could handle it. I bet you could. And I'm glad that you answered that way. Now, do you currently own or rent? And she said, I own. And I said, well, that's exciting. And she said, well, what I was really looking to do was refinance my property. And I said, well, isn't that a great idea to use real estate, leverage real estate to buy real estate? And she said, well, well yeah, isn't it? I was like, absolutely. Pause. The conversation started with $10,000 cash and I want a $1,500 payment. The conversation evolved into, I bought a $380,000 property 10 months ago and I believe I have $80,000 in equity. Through rapport, and dialogue and communicating, we went from, I'm going to blow this lead out of the water because they're dead to me. $10,000 won a $1,500 payment to, I own a piece of real estate that I should have $80,000 in equity that I'm happy to refinance. Should I be able to and buy my first piece of real estate? The moral of the story here is, is never judge a book by its cover and never take what people say as gospel. Because most people have no idea what they're actually saying. None. They have no idea. And so it's your job to build rapport, to listen through, connect and be solution oriented. And so in this example, this person now got referred to the preferred lender. This person is a refi with leveraging the equity that they have to put down on their first investment. And now we have repair money now we have down payment. Now we have closing costs and we have a bona fide lead. Because the lead came in as a $55,000 mobile home. And the first answer to the question was, I got 20%. When they don't got 20%, yet they have assets that can allow them to pursue their goal when she opened up her heart and shared what her financial goals were. Because I care, because I asked, because I connected. And you see, prospecting is simply conversations. It's not interrogation, it's not agenda driven. It's simply talk to people about where they are in their life, and where they want to go in their real estate goals. And so I didn't know how I was going to be able to intertwine that, Anna, but yet I leveraged our role play into a real life scenario that has yes. happened. Um, I need, yes, ma'am. I need to uh... mute. That's what we need to. All right. What's next? How did we do, Anna? Was that all right? 
Yeah, that was perfect. I actually was um, kind of afraid when I first started talking to this person because uh, I really want to help him. They're the nicest people ever. I've talked to him and his wife before and they're the nicest people ever. Um, they're not at all computer savvy. So the whole process of pre-qualifying them, um, I, I help them through that. And, and I, I ask them the, the right questions. They have cash. They, they also are open to maybe taking out a loan. So, but I, I just wanted to make sure that I was crossing my T's and dotting my I's when it comes to like the questions that I'm asking and, and how I should go about this because I don't want a dead deal at the end of the month. Well, the moment that they agree to borrow money to achieve their financial goals, you immediately hand it over. Yeah. With soft baton and then let the loan officer decide. Then you let the loan officer decide whether or not this is a feasible lead going forward. Because in, in this example, to have $50,000 and want a $1,000 holding cost isn't realistic. It's just not. Yeah. And we can let the loan officer help themselves discover what is feasible. That's all. Teamwork. And your job is to create enough value to allow the loan officer to do their job, which is qualify them. Sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, team, what's next? Lee, can you um, run through how to do a CMA? Um, yeah. Yeah, I can. Do we have a particular property that we would like to do a CMA on? I mean, I know you're in New York. Um, yeah, I'm in New York. I, I don't have access to that MLS. So, Lance, you got one? Yeah. Can I give you? Can I give you one? Yeah. Go ahead. And and Lee, while we're doing the CMA, is this where you would do like that inventory analysis that you had sort of done? That's before? part of this. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Lance. Six zero two one Southwest. 36 court Miramar 330 actually I have a better one for you because this is one I'm, I'm actually getting ready to put on the market so this would help me greatly 3730 Southwest 45th Terrace West Park all right hey that's a so we're going to come in here and the first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to see if this property was ever listed before. So let's just see kind of what we got going on. So we have 3730 Southwest 45th and we have zero. Okay. So this property was never, um, never listed by an agent. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come over to IMAP. IMAP is your best friend. You absolutely want to learn how to leverage IMAP, and this is going to be some of your first chance. So we're in Broward County. We're going to put the minimum amount of data in, and survey says, why do we have two? Is this Terrace and Avenue? Thank you. Good eye. Good eye. Good eye. All right. So here we are, we have property address, we have the owner, which is an LLC. Um, as we scroll through, we have the legal description right here. And then here we have the history. So this person bought the property in, wow. 2018 for 140. Yeah. 
So check this out. A little bit of a story. There was a divorce. Then they transferred the property to Carter. Um, Carter transferred the property to Diane. And Diane sold the property to this investor. And that's the hierarchy or the, the, the pattern. Not that that brings any relevance to the CMA. It's just we're detectives. That's our job mm -hmm. is to learn what we need to learn about the property. So there was the original owner kind of through here. And as we come through, this property was bought in 2018. So two years ago, two and a half years ago for $140,000. Let's dive in and see what we got. So as we come down here, we got a 3-1, 852 square, 726 square feet. That was adjusted to 781 and uh, was built in 1955. Now, before you do a CMA, it is very important that you do what's called a pre-qualification. Uh -huh. And a pre-qualification or a pre-qual is a list of questions that help you be the best agent you can be. The list of questions are on our closed Facebook group under, um, under files. So if you go to our Facebook group and look under files, you will find the pre-qual form. You can also go to uh, win with sellers which is a manual in KW Connect, win with sellers, and there's a seller prequal form there. Now, the reason I bring this up now is because this part right here will be brought up when you ask, will you please briefly describe the home to me? They'll tell you it has three bedrooms, one bath. It's about 800 square feet. And you now have a general idea versus going in blind. It will also give you a heads up if they say it's a 3-2 and tax rule says 3-1, we know we're going to run into some problems because that means permits weren't pulled on the bathroom and that's going to be a problem. As you can see in the history, They've never sold the property on the MLS, which means that people might have done additions and done things to the property that the city never got wind of. Again, the main reason that you always 100% of the time pre-qualify your listing appointments. It is a cardinal sin in real estate to go on a listing appointment that you haven't pre-qualified by asking the questions. A story for another day is going through the pre-qual form. So for those of you that are on this call often, or for those of you that this is your first time, asterisk that and I'd be more than happy to review how to pre-qualify a seller. We're now jumping to the next part, which is a CMA. Again, we do not do CMAs if we do not pre-qualify. You can, but then you'll have a don't let this happen to you folder. <laughs> I'm teaching you best practices. I'm teaching you best practices. So, all right. So now we got what we need here. Um, we have a 3-1 about 781 square feet. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dive into the MLS. We're going to go back to search. We're now going to go to map. And we're going to type in the address. It has found it. So we are going to zoom out. And we're going to see what we got going on. So as you guys can see, this community is pretty much solidified. Now, usually when there's a main road cutting through, 
one side is different than the other, but based on what we want to do, we're going to do a square search just like this of this particular neighborhood. When we look, we have, let's go back to criteria. We have seven properties that are for sale. Now I wanna do research, I'm a detective. So I wanna see what's active to see if they're anywhere near our comp. So our comp is a three one under a thousand square feet. Well, we got a couple three ones and we're all over the square footage. All over with square footage. So the good news is, is we got a couple. Let's go back to criteria and let's now add a little bit of our criteria. So we got a three bedroom, one to two square feet or one to two baths. And we want to do living, let, let's leave the living area as it is. Actually, let's do zero to 1100. Let's do this under adjusted. Lee, can, can I see your map for a second to see how big you made that square? Because yeah. I came up with 10. I, I, I think I made my square too big. Yeah, I stayed from 41st to Hallandale Beach from 48th to 32nd. Gotcha, thank you. And it was only because I'm looking at it and this looks like the neighborhood. 32nd to 46, got it. And I could be off. I don't know the neighborhood yet. I'm just in data collection mode. That's all I'm doing right now is I'm learning the neighborhood. I don't have to know Opalaka. I can just spend 20 to 30 minutes studying Opalaka and I'll know everything I need to know about Opalaka. I don't need to know where this neighborhood is. I just need to spend 20 to 30 minutes diving in and learning the neighborhood. There's no such thing as a neighborhood expert. There's only, do you know how to study real estate and will you take the time to study it? With that being said, let's now go back to criteria. We brought our criteria down to three matches, which is kind of what we wanted to do. Then let's see what's active, pending, and closed in the last six months. Active with contract, pending, and close in the last six months. And we got ourselves plenty of comps, plenty of yeah, comps. Not to, not to be a pain in your ass, Lee, I don't wanna be the asshole, but I've got 16, you've got 11, and I'm, I'm identical to you. You're not. What identical. am I doing wrong? You didn't put the square feet adjusted? Oh, you said adjusted, living. zero to, oh, okay, nice. I thought remember, you said living area. guys, when we come back down here, adjusted okay. area is 781. Yep, yep. Adjusted area. This is why the details of studying IMAP is very important to be your first step because something was added where they added 50 to 60 square feet. Mm -hmm. Not that that really matters, but when we get to the next steps, this is what we're going to want to see. All right, so now we got our 11. Let's dive in. All right, so one of my, we got a range of 215 to 285. Now, one of my favorite things to do is get this little plus sign. As you guys can see, I hovered it over bed. Mm -hmm. Get that little plus sign, click, and go to insert column. Go to search and type in SQFT for square foot and go to sold per square foot. Mm -hmm. Apply. Moving on over. So it goes next to what is sold. And you can see here price per square foot is pretty tight. Price per square foot is pretty tight. We are snap right on. If we list anywhere in here, we gonna sell. We have one anomaly at 285 and that has an extra bathroom. 
So as you guys could see, this looks like a comp to me. And yet it's sold at 285 a square foot where we really are hovering around 250. You guys see that? Can I get an amen? All right. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Maybe so, more like 245, no? Yeah, it could be. Again, we're just, this market's so hot that if you're literally taking a, uh, a, a golf ball and toss it into a bathtub. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> try to miss that one. So, so now we have, we have, let's see what our actives are. Insert column. Again, SQFT, list price per square foot. Mm -hmm. And let's see what these guys have done to be missed, to miss. 309, 286, 417. You guys see why they're still on the market? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Now, what this tells me with this one is that it's probably destroyed inside. Because at 286, or this is an anomaly. Yep, yep. So let's see what this is at 286. So this is active at 286. And okay, it's all right. Simple, simple, simple. All right, it's a simple property. So now let's look at the 286. Now let's look at the 286 that sold. No pictures, oh, there we go. Doesn't look any better condition wise, but my first reaction is that the lot was pretty big. So let's look at the lot. And I know I'm going all over the place, guys, but the good news is this is recorded. And the better news is, is that you could come back and look at it and just get the principles down. Okay, a, let me be very clear right now. A CMA is an art, not a science. Mm -hmm. To create value through a CMA, it is an art. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna explain what that means, Monique. What that means is that some artists paint with paintbrushes. Some artists paint with dots. Some artists paint with their body. Yet it's all art. And at the end of the day, it creates a masterpiece, but not one is right and not one is wrong. So a CMA is an art. Verse science is two plus two is four. Three plus one is four. There's only two ways or two avenues of getting to four, two times two. So please know that there's, if you were to speak to five other agents that are highly successful, they may do CMAs a little bit differently. That doesn't make them right and me wrong. It simply means, it simply means that as long as we get to the result the same way, a piece of art, then we're right. This is the way I do it, which, okay, is, uh, which is steps. Lee. Yes, Rafi. Would you say that there are certain things that are absolute though? Meaning obviously people have different methods of doing a CMA, but like what are certain things that are kind of, I wouldn't say required, but very important to to think about everything that i've done so far so you're going to go back and you're going to watch this recording and you're going to look at each of the steps that i've done that i stopped and repeated and slowed down and pointed out that's exactly what is important okay now if you really want an analytical answer download win with sellers 
and study the CMA portion? That's the analytical answer, Rafi. I'm showing you how I paint a picture. Win with okay. sellers, how to price property. There's an entire section on creating a CMA. There's the analytical answer for you to have your check marks. Okay. All right, fair enough. So is All right. Lot size bigger on this than the other? I don't know. That's what I'm going to figure out right now. Thank you for bringing me back to where I was. <laughs> okay. That's what we need to figure out. So this particular property, we have a lot of 6,000 square feet. Right there. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go back to, this is what's sold, 6,000 square feet. Then we're going to go here. And we're at a bigger, a bigger lot. 7588. This is the one that's still active. But interesting enough, 315, 215. 315, mm -hmm. 215. Yep. I'm sorry, adding another 200 square feet doesn't add a hundred thousand dollars to value. Yep. Just doesn't <laughs> do it, folks. Just doesn't do it. A bank isn't going to go, I'm going to give you another $100,000 for that 200 square feet. This is a product of someone looking at the numbers and going, well, I have a better product, so I deserve an extra, I deserve that square footage. Price per square foot I'm talking about. Right. So this, is, this has been on the market is 286 a square foot. This has been on the market for 147 days. <laughs> Sorry. The, the inside living square feet was the same on both? Um, no, this is a little bit bigger. The one that's still active at the same price per square foot. Okay. I was going off a of price per square foot. 285, mm -hmm. 286. So I, I don't know the condition of our subject, Lance, which is why it's really important to have the conversation. Will you please briefly describe the home to me? What upgrades have you done inside the home? So we're gonna now go off of what has sold. We have a 239, a 231, a 240, a 246 and a 251. I'm gonna go off a 251. I'm cool with giving them the top of the market that isn't an anomaly. Mm -hmm. So two, 251 times 781, equals 196. I would feel comfortable listing this at 199, 205, something like that. Mm -hmm. Lance, what price did you come up with? I came up with 220. Good for you. And but I think but Good I think for you. That, <laughs> but I think that you're right, Lee. You're you're closer because um, kitchen needs to be rehabbed. It's got terrazzo floors. Um, the only upgrade that, that the owner's done in the last year is they put a brand new roof on it. Um, other than that. But simply, Lance, don't all homes need a good roof? Yes. So did they put the roof on for themselves? <laughs> or did they put the roof on for the, buyer. For the next buyer? <laughs> right. For themselves. And the answer is all homes, especially if you're selling it, need a good roof. Yep. <laughs> so that just brings it to selling standard. Doesn't improve the value. Right. Okay. So I think probably you're right. Uh, I'll probably just list it at an even 200. I don't think I'll go 205 because I want to catch those people that are looking between 175 and 200. 
So here's, I'm with you. So here's what's important about this conversation right now, team. Really, really, really important. Oh, yeah, perfect. That's what I want to do. Here's what's really important. Is if Lance was to list it at 220, it might sell. I'm not saying it's not. Yet when you price it correctly, let's use 199, 900 as the price. Mm -hmm. What we're doing now is we're creating an auction effect. We're creating an energy because this market is hot. This market will provide us with the leverage that if we were a little off on price, we're going to have five, six, seven offers in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. When you have five offers versus scratching and clawing for one at 220, when you have five offers, you get to do what professionals do in real estate. Negotiate terms. Negotiate terms. Amateurs focus on price. Professionals negotiate terms. For those of you that were in Sheikah's class, you heard me say that earlier in just a different way. Terms are what professionals negotiate. Amateurs focus on price. I'll give you your price all day. And then I'll negotiate in terms for repairs and all this other stuff. And I'll beat you up later. Verse, I got five offers. You're going to waive inspection contingency. We're getting cash only. And we're closing in three weeks. Terms are what professionals focus on. And you can't negotiate terms if you only got one offer. I mean, aggressively. Of course you can. But if you got five offers and you say, hey, I got five offers. We're asking for highest and best by tomorrow at 11 a.m. Please put everything in writing. And we will then negotiate with the highest and best offer. Now you got agents fighting against each other versus you having to do a bunch of stuff because you learned how to price property correctly and how to negotiate with multiple offers aggressively to create the best terms for your client, the seller. How'd I do?